Well, thank you for being on our webinar today. This is a very exciting webinar we've got planned, one in our School Climate Transformation <laughs> webinar series. My name is Jessica Swain Bradway, and I have the honor of introducing our presenters and our webinars. I'm very excited about today's topic, key systems features of tier two and three. Um, and I'm very excited to hear Dr. Tim Lewis talk us through these things. Dr. Lewis is a professor of special education at the University of Missouri. He directs the University of Missouri Center for School-Wide Positive Behavior Support, and he's one of our co-directors of the National OSEP-funded Technical Assistance Center. Um, I have learned a great deal from Dr. Lewis and his team in developing guidance uh, for school-wide PBS teams to implement. And I think it's important for us to focus in on our systems because we know if it's hard at tier one, it's going to be harder at tiers two and three. As a reminder for all of our uh, new folks, all of the materials and the recordings for our School Climate Transformation Grant Series will be posted at www.pbs.org. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Lewis. Hey, thanks, Jessica. Um, just a couple other kind of advanced organizers. Um, outcomes for today, I wanna to walk you through, particularly looking at readiness criteria for both two and three. Um, I know there's uh, sort of high anxiety sometimes and people are anxious to get going to address some of those more difficult, challenging issues within schools, but we know that without building that strong foundation, we're gonna have limited success. And oftentimes uh, we, we inadvertently kind of um, condemn ourselves to, to systems and strategies that implode. Talk a little bit about, and in, in particular, some of those key universal prerequisites that we know are critical and essential to making sure we can put uh, tier two and tier three in place with high fidelity, as well as uh, kids are responsive. And then we'll talk through a little bit of some key systems and practices within tier two and tier three. Um, as usual, we only have an hour. Uh, the intent of these webinars really is to kind of give you some big ideas. All of these materials, the PowerPoint, as Jessica mentioned, will be on pbis.org um, shortly following the conclusion of this, as well as the recorded version. So. If you're having trouble sleeping some night, you can pop this back on and, and um, it'll probably put you right under. Hopefully you're all smiling and laughing. Um, a couple other pieces. I put some polls in as we go, just to kind of get a sense who's here and give people an opportunity to give me a little bit of feedback um, in terms of where you are in your own implementation. At any time though, the chat box there, go ahead and type in a question. Uh, I will monitor the best I can, uh, as well as I know Jessica also is behind the scenes kind of monitoring, and if something pops up, we'll um, interrupt and or kind of weigh in, okay? So let's get going. First of all, I'd like to kind of know who's here. And so what will happen on your screen is a poll will pop up, and if you would just kind of select uh, probably what best represents your role in terms of implementing and your Grant. So far, we've got kind of a good distribution. We've got coaches, we've got faculty, um, got some LEA coordinators, and uh, a few SEA coordinators. That's fantastic. So it looks like we've got to get a kind of a broad representation here. Remember, the goal of these webinars, as I said, is to give kind of big ideas and to give you some things to think about to then go back and continue to build. Always reach out to your partner from the center as you're implementing, whether it's tier one through tier two and tier three. That's sort of our role. We continue to be here to make sure all of you are successful. Okay, um, starting point. If you've ever heard me give a presentation, ever heard me talk, I always start with a slide. Some of you will be hauntingly familiar, others it might be new. Um, but I think it's important because it really gets at the heart and soul and the essential piece of what we're trying to do when we create multi-tiered system support or continuums of behavior support for kids with both challenging social as well as academic uh, issues. And the first thing that I point out all the time to educators is, look, I can't make kids behave. 
We can't make kids behave. We can't make kids learn. When people come to us and say, hey, we've got these kids, they're out of control, help us make them behave, we always have to stop them and say, look, we don't have strategies to make kids behave. However, the good news is, as educators, we can create environments to increase the likelihood. On the academic side, we get that. When I ask teachers about kids who are struggling to learn to read or struggling to learn science or math, what they basically tell me is they give me a long list of strategies that they would try. And if I keep asking them, what if that doesn't work? They tell me, well, I would try something else. I would talk to somebody else. I would seek out more information. Then when I ask them about kids presenting significant challenging behavior, it's usually, well, they've got to be gone. They've got to be punished. They've got to be kicked out. Now, once again, I know I'm sort of preaching to the choir here today, particularly for those of you who um, have got some of the School Climate Transformation grants and are implementing multi-tiered system support. But it's really important as you go back and as you keep building your systems, especially when we get to tier two and tier three, tier two and tier three are going to be successful only to the degree which we have strong, solid universals, and only to the degree that we start working collaboratively across all of the staff and faculty within our building to help everybody understand this basic logic. It's not about making kids behave, it's about building environments to increase the likelihood. And then from 25 plus years of research, we know that environments increase the likelihood are guided by a core curriculum and in both consistency and fidelity. Once again, going back to your universals, identifying those core critical outcomes to replace problem behaviors, continually teaching those behaviors, continually giving kids positive, specific feedback in developmentally appropriate ways is critical and essential to being successful at tier two as well as tier three. So as you're thinking about building your systems, keep coming back to this point about it's not fixing the kid or it's not adding something to the kid. It's adding supports in our environment to increase the likelihood that young person is successful. Now, I joke, uh, I am one of the co-directors, so I am federally required by law to show circles and triangles. Um, but the circles and triangles are important also conceptually in that I recall sort of we drew this up again well over 20 years ago, and the basic logic has stayed the same. We always start with data. Everybody want to know the practices. What's the latest, greatest? What tier two practices? What tier three practices do we put in point or put in place? Um, and as, we, as we've done since the beginning with universals, we always start with data. Data then drive and make sure we identify those key practices. And then the third piece, the most critical piece, the most important piece, how do we support each other? How do we make sure everybody across the building understands what the purpose of that tier two or tier three support is? How do we make sure everybody understands what their role is in implementation of that support, as well as supporting the adults who have lead and responsibility on those pieces? The other piece that you've seen is the triangle, and it looks like my red is bleeding out. <laughs> Maybe that's indicative of the, of the topic today, uh, looking at those more intensive supports. Sometimes it feels like they're outnumbering us uh, and, and they're literally sort of expanding before our eyes. But the basic logic is this. We create a single behavioral support system. We then intensify that support system based on the intensity of the challenges. So it's not that we're going to do highly different and unique things when we get into tier two and tier three. It's more a matter of providing additional practices and supports around tier two and then making sure we individualize those supports. But the basic logic is still gonna be there. What do you want the kid to do instead? How do you teach in practice? How do you give specific positive feedback? And how do you make sure, as I said, across those school environments, everybody understands that logic and everybody's following through with that core set of implementation procedures? So real quick, uh, continue to also apply that same logic that we talked about within universals. First, we continue to work with teams. On that team, we must have an administrator. That universal team should continue within your school, even if you've met all the readiness. And if you're looking at implementing a tier three now, we still need to make sure we continue with those universals. We still need to make sure we've got good representation from our school on that team. We want to make sure everybody's voice is heard. One of the questions we get all the time is, how do you get buy-in? How do you get people on board? 
And I point out the professional literature is real clear. You get buy-in, you get support by solving problems. You make my life better as a classroom teacher, I'm on board. If you make my job in managing hundreds of kids across the playground uh, better, I'm on board. So that team concept, that communication concept, both ways, checking in with colleagues still needs to be critical and essential. Now, we'll talk about as we move into tier two, tier three, we tend to then create a new team, if you will. We still need cross-representation to that universal, but our tier two, tier three teams tend to be comprised of folks with more behavioral or academic expertise. So our school psychs, our counselors, um, our special ed, our social workers still need administrators on those teams. But that basic team, that basic problem solving process stays in place. We talked about the importance of database decision. We talked about the importance of instruction. Even at tier three, even when we talk about kids with significant mental health challenges, literature is still clear. Connecting with kids, building supportive, safe, predictable environments through teaching and practicing some of the most effective strategies we have. We've got to continue to acknowledge mastery of those social skills. In other words, giving kids positive feedback. This is probably one of those most misunderstood pieces about what school-wide PBS is all about. And I can't tell you the number of times I've heard how all you're doing is bribing kids to behave. This is not about bribing kids to behave. Bribe by definition means giving money or favor to do something illegal. And ask children to be respectful and responsible. It's not illegal. It's critical, though, that we make sure it maps and matches kids' needs. It's critical that it's sincere and genuine. It's critical in that it's instructive. Think about a math error, right? You wouldn't yell and scream. You wouldn't sort of post that. You wouldn't threaten to send the kid out. If kid made a math error, what you would do is you would problem solve why that math error occurred. You would teach and practice a little bit more. They get it correct, you celebrate. If they get it wrong, you go right back to square one and do some more teaching and practicing. So it's really important that we continue to make sure we're giving those kids feedback. We apply the logic to correct problem behaviors as well. Uh, one of the other questions we get all the time is what should we do when kids break major rules? What should we do if kids are violating uh, some of our sanctions, right? Is there a place for quote unquote punishments? Um, is there a place for quote unquote corrective action? And our advice and recommendation is always to, again, apply the logic. For example, lots of schools we work with have in-school suspension. Basically, you've done the crime, so you owe the time. We park you in a room. We might give you some busy work. Um, the logic is we're removing you from that environment, and somehow you're going to learn what to do instead. Apply the logic, even in those corrective. So in the schools we work in, whether it's a Saturday school or an in-school suspension, Instead of just having them sit there and do the time, we work on the skills that got them sent there. So we work on anger management, we work on conflict resolution, we work on emotional regulation. So yes, kids are so disruptive learning environment, you remove them. The challenge is how do you wanna make sure that you prevent it from happening again and you don't rely on that response as a strategy to change behavior. And then, as I said, readiness is, is key. Um, it used to be we would come and train in the fall and do universals, and then we'd come back to your school maybe February, do tier two. Uh, and then if we had time at the end of the year, we'd come back and train on tier three. Uh, and and <laughs> again, we used to do that because we learned real quick that was a really inefficient model and no school district state had the capacity to implement at that pace with limited support. So we're continually looking at those readiness con conditions. Now, just quick overview. We know about universals. Tier two, the essential pieces here. One, we want to identify kids sooner rather than later. One of the things we've learned is that really good teachers, you guys hang in there too long. Or we see some signs of risk, but we're not quite sure what to do. And so we sort of just like, well, let's just keep an eye on it. We want to make sure as soon as kids hit decision rules that we've determined and set up for our school that we at least have a conversation. And we at least explore what else could we put in the environment to increase the likelihood of this child's successful. And we'll talk a little bit more about each of these um, as we go this morning or as we go this afternoon, depending on where you are. We do some very informal assessment uh, to match intervention. We tend to recommend three strategies at tier two. 
the other critical piece is you guys work with your schools is you got to keep going back to your colleagues and reminding them tier two supports are for kids who are just sort of pushing it, who are just showing a bit of sign of risk, who are first start bubbling up. Tier two supports will not be robust enough to take on those really intensive challenges. And I've seen a lot of my schools and districts, they get universals, they're doing great, teachers are patient, and we start at tier two and they say, great. And they want to dump all of those really, really heavy hitters into tier two supports. It's going to be difficult and challenging for you, but you've got to remind your colleagues, no, <laughs> these aren't designed for those tough kids. We're going to do those intensive individuals for those tough kids. These are for kids first showing signs of risk. These are for kids who are first showing signs of not being successful. So we do some additional social skill instruction, whether it's small group, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, whatever that may look like. We do some self-management. At the elementary middle school, we encourage schools to take a look at check in, check out. Uh, at the secondary high school, uh, we encourage schools to take a look at check and connect out of uh, the University of Minnesota. Both are development appropriate, both are age appropriate, um, and we know that again, it provides those kids with that additional set of supports because I can't make them behave, but I can build environments to increase the likelihood. And we progress monitor. Um, if we're going to spend a lot of time and energy in putting in a, a support in place, make sure that we carefully monitor. If it's not working, we need to tweak. We need to adjust. If it is working, we need to start planning to fade that out. And then in very bright red letters, as we know, it has to be linked to those universals if we're going to be successful. Tier three, then, when kids don't respond to tier two, right? Um, the other question I get all the time is, well, do we have to run everybody through tier one and tier two? And I said, you know, if you've got kids stabbing others and setting fire, go right to tier three. Uh, check in, check out probably isn't going to address that challenge. Again, hopefully you're sitting there in front of your computer smiling, at least, if not laughing, because you've got to have a sense of humor as well as we move up and we deal with kids with, with tough behaviors. We're going to primarily be driven by functional behavioral assessment looking at what's maintaining. Why is this kid doing the behavior that they're doing? Why are they not doing the quote unquote appropriate? That's going to be the logic that we're going to primarily follow. Now, this is the time, however, that we start bringing in and making uh, much more solid connections, if you will, at least in some of the intervention planning to mental health and other agencies. You know, oftentimes these kids will display some pretty significant dysfunction have some pretty significant mental health challenges and issues. And we as educators are simply not set up to deal with that. We as educators can absolutely play our role and we should. And as I stated earlier, those safe, predictable, connected environments continue to be some of the most effective strategies, regardless of what challenges these kids are seeing in their lives. But this is also now where we're bringing in some of those services. It's key that they basically support each other. When we get to tier three, we don't want this perception of, okay, well, that mental health person is going to come in and fix that kid. Or that kid's on an IEP, so the special educator's job is to fix that kid. No. Here's the logic. Think about that continuum. Think about that triangle. We underscore, and once again, you see in very, very bright red letters, all of these things have to be linked. The degree to which your tier two supports, even the degree to which your tier three supports are going to be successful is the degree to which you've got good, solid universals. The logic of functional assessment is this. I try to figure out what, what's maintaining the behavior. Why is this kid doing that behavior? And then I identify that function. Oh, I think this kid's doing it for lots of attention. That's the easy part, right? And I can teach the kid what the appropriate thing to do to get attention. Most of the time, the kid already knows. The challenge is changing the environment such that that child doesn't get his or her need met anymore unless they do the quote unquote appropriate. So we talk a lot about we have to compete with what's going on in that environment. That's a tall order. If I'm a 14 year old and I'm in a middle school and I'm wandering the hall and I've got six different class periods, I have thousands of opportunities to get attention around my problem behavior. Unless the environment doesn't allow me to access that, Whatever plan you put in place is going to have limited to no impact. Even tier two, think about check and connect or check and check out. The value isn't the check in the morning and the check out at night. The value is multiple adults interacting with kids, giving them those pre-corrects. Here's what you need to work on. 
giving them positive specific feedback when they show mastery, problem solving when they're not showing mastery. So the tier two, tier three, as I said, are really just an intensification of that basic logic all of you are doing at universals. And they've got to be connected. Otherwise, you have limited to very no generalization. You have limited to very no maintenance. Uh, and that's been a perennial problem uh, for, for decades in dealing with kids. And that's really what led us into our work thinking about, well, if we're going to be successful, we've got to do this system wide. We've got to start thinking school wide. We can't just rely on specialists like the counselor to run a small group and somehow that's going to be sufficient. Sometimes it is. 99.9% .9 it's not. And it's those linkages back to those environmental supports that are so key, so critical. So as I said before, readiness is really important and data really drive when you're ready. And let me show you an example. When we look at sort of readiness pieces, there's a document on pbis.org that's fairly comprehensive and, and it kind of overwhelms folks. What we did is we identified all of the possible variations uh, in terms of what you should be thinking about before you move into tier two or before you move into tier three. At minimum, here's what we look for. We look for fidelity around universals. In particular, we look for some effort and attention made at the classroom. Still all about the classroom. Majority of problems occur there. Unless we support our classroom teachers, again, we're gonna have limited success. We look for some of those outcomes, right? So we've got that fidelity uh, measured by the set or the benchmarks of quality or the new tiered fidelity inventory. We look for your self-assessment. Are most staff reporting that we've got critical pieces in place? We also look for outcomes. Okay, we're implementing with fidelity, but we're not making a difference. A lot of folks think universal means we do it the same way as everybody else. Universal means everybody gets it. It's going to look different in your school. So I had some international visitors uh, and we took them to typical high schools. We took them to a complete self-contained special ed high school. They were implementing school or PBS. They were implementing MTSS. It looked very different, however, because the intensity had to match the intensity of dealing with an entire population of young people with moderate to severe disabilities. They're still doing universal, meaning everybody's getting it. They're still holding everybody accountable to those outcomes. They're still teaching and practicing, but the intensity had to match the intensity of those learning challenges. So here's a great example of an elementary school I worked with. They scored, I think, 90% on the school-wide evaluation tool. They are implementing with high fidelity. And the teachers are saying, we're ready. We need tier two, we need tier three. And the assistant principal said, hold on, here's our data at the, uh, at the end of the year when people were thinking, okay, by next school year, we've got to have some things in place. They were not in line with kind of what we'd expect, that sort of 80, 15, five, right? So they've got about over a third of their kids hopping right now needing tier two or tier three supports. And they had 57 students with nine or more. And overall they had 1,000, 712 office referrals. And so this assistant principal, all she did was process kids. These data are a great example of how we're implementing fidelity. We're not implementing with enough intensity. So what did they do? They spent an entire year ramping up the intensity of tier one. So they taught on a much more frequent basis, much higher rates of feedback. And in particular, they focused on how to support classroom teachers, how to support each other within that room. And by the end of the year, here's what happened. They still haven't put tier two in place yet. They weren't ready for tier two. They weren't ready for tier three. They're ready now. They're down from 1700 to 516. They're only got about 17% of their school population now needing those additional supports. They've got 16 kids with nine or more. 16 kids on individual plans is manageable. 57 is not manageable, right? Just simply not manageable. So what do I mean by classroom supports? The crew in my center spent a lot of time and energy looking at all the research, all the textbooks out there on classroom management and basically boiled it down to saying, here's what research shows over and over and over are critical and essential. And most of these should look again, hauntingly familiar to folks on the webinar today. Classroom expectation rules defined and taught. We use the school wide, but we make them fit our classroom. Uh, we've got procedures and routines defined and taught high rates of positive feedback to correctives and so forth. The challenge is this, how do we make sure every teacher in our school building is implementing these with the intensity to match the intensity of the learning challenges? 
And when you first did that school assessment survey, if you've done that, you probably found an interesting thing. School-wide was kind of uneven, non-classroom hit and miss, uh, individual students was a mess, nothing's in place high priority. But when it came to classrooms, everybody pretty much indicated, no, we're doing okay here. And for the most part, they are. When I talk to teachers and they say, oh, I'm doing that, oh, I've been doing those things for years, they absolutely are doing them. They've absolutely been doing them for years, but they may not be implementing with enough intensity to match the learning and behavioral challenges of the kids. And so what we have spent probably the last five, six years, uh, both here in Missouri, as well as across within our national center, is how do we get these features in place? How do we build supportive environments for the teachers, not just the kids? Same logic. So what we've done is apply that same problem solving logic. We start with data. So we do two things. We start with self-assessments, and here's an example. Again, there are many of them on our website, uh, both pbis.org or uh, our website here in Missouri, pbismissouri.org. In fact, uh, you can download many modules. You can download more classroom supports uh, than you'll ever need, including little video vignettes of all of those practices. Uh, and hopefully by this summer, actually self-guided modules and looking at some of these key pieces. So we start with self-assessment. Everybody in the school does this anonymously and we turn it in and we ask teachers, be honest. We oftentimes in our schools will do a quiz. Teachers say, oh no, I'm doing those things. Okay, let's give a quiz to your class. Class, when the teacher, whatever the attention signal is, most kids stop and listen. When the class starts, teacher has everything ready. Before we start a new activity, the teacher reminds us, in other words, we want to get a sense that the kids identify, yep, those things are in place. And these classroom quizzes, you know, take a little bit of ego strength because teachers will tell, oh, no, we're doing it, we're doing it. But then, wow, only 60% of the kids agreed. We've got to go back and teach. We've got to go back and practice. They're doing it. They've got it posted. Maybe not with the intensity, right? So once again, we're doing this school-wide. We're not singling two teachers out. We're not just doing it in one grade level. Everybody in the school is giving us information and data. Based on that data, we then target and focus on one skill. Again, here's the website where you can actually dial in and get these little mini modules, see little video vignettes, worksheets, um, supporting activities to put all of those eight essential features in place. So we've gotten away from, and here's, here's an example of, of what what that looks like within those modules. Uh, as I said, there's supporting pieces, there's activities, there's self-assessment and so forth. Here's what we do. We've gotten away from, because teachers tell us point blank, look, I can't go to a three-day workshop and learn 100 things I'm supposed to do in my classroom. I need classroom supports when I need classroom supports. And I ask, what does that mean? Well, that means when I've tried everything I know how to do, that's when I need some assistance. Or when a lot of teachers are expressing similar, we're all struggling during this class period or this activity we have within our school. So we start with data. In addition to the self-assessment, we look at our, our data. Why are kids getting sent out of the classroom? Under what conditions? Is it during independent work? Uh, is it during a particular time of day? Uh, is it a subject matter? You know, what's going on? Again, not blaming anybody, not laying fault, but trying to pinpoint if we're going to put time and energy into a strategy, where should we start? So based on that, we pick one skill. Let's say we're looking at opportunities to respond. We notice teachers are struggling with that. We notice that they're saying, well, yeah, I probably don't give enough. So we start with a brief in-service, 10, 15 minutes. And that's where those, those modules on PBIS Missouri can help you out because there's the PowerPoints there, the activities. It's all ready to go. Then, as an entire school, for the next month, for the next two months, we focus on that one skill. And just like the kids, we need feedback on our learning. So we've looked at a lot of different strategies to give each other that feedback. Uh, one option is peer coaching. So Jessica and I get along okay. We're both uh, eighth grade teachers. We both teach science. I find a time, 10 minutes, I can go into Jessica's room, and I count the number of opportunities to respond. I leave that data on her desk, I go away. She finds 10 minutes, she can come and watch and count for me and does the same thing. We don't meet, we don't you know, do evaluation. I look at my number, it's like, ooh, that's pretty low. I go back to the strategies that I learned in that brief end service. Oh, dry erase boards, whiteboards, that's great. I I'm gonna try that. 
right? So peer coaching principles. You're supposed to do a walkthrough each week. Uh, for the most part, you come in and you're a pretty disruptive factor. Kids are wondering, what are you doing here? Uh, and, and off you go. The little app that you see there, the student classroom observation, you can download from the app store. I think it's three bucks. And so some of our schools, the principals, when they do their walkthrough, they pull that up. Uh, they enter the teacher and it's the same thing. I count the number of opportunities to respond that I saw. I hit send. Teacher is the only one who owns this data. When we get administrators involved, when we collect data, um, we make rules saying only the teacher owns the data. The exception is if we take names off and we just look at how we're doing as a school. The idea here is not to be evaluative, it's not to be good and bad, it's where are we, how do we continue to improve, right? Um, again, <laughs> Jessica reminded me, nope, we don't get any money on this app store. Uh, this is a colleague of ours, worked with some folks to develop this, uh, to use as research, but we found it really helpful in applications. And related to that, the other question that I get is, you know, principals will pull me aside and it's like, well, Tim, I got a new teacher. Um, he's really struggling. Can you recommend a good teacher? They can go watch. And thankfully, I can recommend many. There are some just some dynamite teachers out there. But I tell the principal, here's the problem. They'll go in they won't know what they're looking for. And basically what they'll think is, well, this teacher doesn't have any problem kids. She doesn't have tough kids, right? What they're not understanding is the level of fluency that really good teachers have developed with those key skills. And so we'll send that teacher in and we'll have them collect data across two or three of those variables. And all of a sudden it's like, holy cow, I just, I didn't realize the frequency with which this teacher's interacting. I didn't realize the frequency that she's giving feedback, whether it's verbal, whether it's nonverbal. And all of a sudden it becomes sort of real about how these things hang together. And as I said, the level of intensity to match the particular child's learning, okay? So those are readiness factors. So I'm kind of curious where all of you are now. Um, how many readiness factors has a school that you're working in or a school that you are primarily assigned to? I know we've got some SEA folks. Um, if you just had to ballpark some schools in your backyard, do they have just universals in place? Do they have universal fidelity plus a documented decrease in problem behaviors? Do they have universal plus a decrease plus targeted classroom supports? So we'll take a couple minutes and, and take a look there. Tim, this is Jessica. And as people are responding, I just want to say thank you so much for such a complete um, and really very elegant treatment of the linkage across tiers starting with our classroom. We see this all the time, and I really appreciate the way you're able to articulate this for our webinar attendees today, so thank you. Absolutely, I mean, it's still all about the classroom. Uh, you know, I clearly remember when we first started this journey, sitting there thinking about, okay, what are school systems made of? You know, we had school-wide, we had non-classroom setting, and then we had individuals, and I'm like, no, 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 classroom. You gotta put classroom on there. It's all about the classroom. The degree to which we're successful in any other area is the degree to which we support each other and we support our teachers. So it looks like many of you have met um, that that third level, which is fantastic. Some of you got uh, the first uh, and a, a small handful of you are kind of somewhere in between. Remember, this isn't good, bad. This isn't, well, if we're just at universal, somehow we're falling short. No, the intent here is to start thinking about, we've got a document, we've got to look at these other readiness pieces. And again, the reason why is if we haven't in particular paid attention to the classroom or we're still dealing with 1,700 office referrals, we're going to have really limited impact with our tier two and our tier three supports. So let's move into and think about the systems. Um, and we'll start with tier two and we'll move into tier three. Uh, and again, I'm mindful of time um, and I'll leave some time at the end for some, some chat questions. I really encourage you to take a look at the tiered fidelity inventory. If you're not using that yet to gauge fidelity, that's okay. But at minimum, download the paper copy from pbs.org and take a look at those critical features. That will really help you think about how we plan our tier two and tier three. That will really help you gauge about, okay, we're not there yet. This is where we need to be in a year or two years. So we need to start planning on how we put those features in place. We need to have a, a, a conversation within our school district or within our state about how we support school districts to put these systems in place. 
Um, and just to kind of share with the folks uh, on the webinar today, for the last five years, what my center has been really focusing on, as well as our partners across the National Center, is moving away school by school and really focusing on working with school districts when it comes to Tier 2 and Tier 3. And we've decided to move in that direction for a couple reasons. One, I don't know of a single individual school out there that has all of the capacity to build Tier 3. When we get to Tier 3 supports, it's going to require us to use district supports, whether it's our school psychologist or our social workers or our counselors, right? So very few people have all that within building. So it makes sense that we start thinking district-wide. The other reason that we've moved towards more district-wide thinking is nobody owns Tier 2. Everybody's on board Universals. Yep, this is our school-wide. We have a great time. We've had Tier 3 systems in place for decades in schools, whether it's through special education, whether it's through student services. We've got people with behavioral expertise, learning expertise. Nobody owns Tier 2, right? Who's responsible for Tier 2? Is it our counselors? Is it the assistant principal? And so for the last five or six years, we've been working with districts to create a single district-wide Tier 2, Tier 3 system. Then each school fills in individual pieces, like what are your specific data decision rules? Or based on what your kids need, here are the two or three strategies we're going to use at Tier 2. But they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Plus, we're identifying people in the district that you can call. So right now, if you've got a Cracker Jack counselor or you've got a school psychologist with lots of experience in, in running social school groups or a special ed teacher or even your art teacher for that matter, then schools do great. But schools who don't have access to that struggle. Doesn't seem sort of right or fair. So the idea is, where do we have resources? Where do we have expertise? How do we build a single system that everybody in our school district can tap? So state folks on the webinar today, start thinking about how you provide TA. And our TA has really shifted from school by school to really working with district personnel. So we've got a couple districts that we are no longer doing any direct training to school teams. We are only working with within district personnel. They're the ones doing the training for the teams. They're the ones that are out there implementing tier two and tier three supports. And our role really has become almost kind of a behind the scenes and simply working with district personnel. Okay. Let's jump in here. And somebody mentioned that they're using the TFI, which is fantastic. Uh, as I said, it's, it's, a document that we spent lots of time and energy carefully thinking through successful schools and schools who are struggling and what the difference is. Um, a couple other things to remember. The science of implementation, everybody goes through these different phases, right? So yes, you might have a rock star school. They're doing tier one, high fidelity, great outcomes. When it comes to tier two, you've got to remember they go right back to step one, which is exploration. Why would we do this? What's in it for us? They're going to try some very small initial implementation. When we do tier two, we say, let's just do one grade level. We're just going to do grade five. Or a middle school, we're just going to do two, team B. And we're going to work through some of the bugs before we launch and go full wide. So those of you who have a coaching role or a training role or a grant coordination role, remember, you've got to find out where that team is in terms of their own implementation. And you need to make sure you move through those in a sequential, well thought out way. In addition, we talk about schools as if they're a thing. <laughs> schools are a collection of individuals and individuals have different learning histories. So another thing to remember is all of those folks in those schools will be at different points in their own learning. Don't keep treating it like an acquisition. They don't know what to do. We need to move to fluency and we need to, if they're at fluent already, then how do we maintain this and how do we generalize? So particularly for those on the, on the webinar today who've got that coaching role or some of that TA role, that implementation science, that learning science is so critical as you think about your own professional development and technical systems. So an example uh, from the TFI team composition, we outline who should be on there. Again, you won't see people's names like you must have a school psychologist, you must have a social worker. We've moved a long time ago to function. You need somebody with behavioral expertise. You need somebody with administrative authority, right? So as you're thinking about and moving, regardless of where you are, continue to self-assess or use this, again, as kind of a roadmap in terms of how the team operates, right? We've got a standard agenda, and you kind of see our scoring criteria uh, in terms of implementation. 
In addition, the TFI has examples and other supporting documents to gather this information and data. So the first rule we start with at Tier 2 or Tier 3 is we have a decision rule. We take a look at data that you're already collecting. So in our schools, we look at major and minor discipline referrals. And we might create a rule such as within one trimester, if a kid has two majors, we bring them to the table. They may not get a Tier 2 support, but let's bring them to the table before they get to the 15th major. Let's start looking at, does this child need some additional pieces that we can put in the environment to increase the likelihood? In particular, if you're not collecting minors or you don't have a way to disaggregate minors, I would really encourage you to start exploring that. Most of the kids that I work with and in most of the schools I work with, those kids who are perfect for tier two are masters at pushing it on a daily basis, but never crossing the line. In other words, I ask teachers to think about these kids. It's like, you know, they get under your skin, they're driving you a bit nuts, they're disruptive, but they've never done the big thing where you sent them to the office. And so the office is gonna have no clue about the level of intensity of this kid. And when we look at those minors over time, they start adding up. And minors over time indicate, we need to get in there and help that classroom teacher because whatever we've got in place now at the universal level isn't sufficient. Another strategy that particularly at the elementary through middle, somewhat at the high school, because we build in those detentions and other, other sort of responses, is measuring time out of instruction. A lot of our schools, we use buddy rooms, right? So I'm disruptive. Uh, you don't need to send me to the office. I don't need administrative action, but we both need a break from each other. So you kick me out. I go to the room next door. I've got my think sheet. I know I walk in. I quietly sit. But what I've done is become a master at quietly sitting and you forget all about me. Uh, and all of a sudden the bell rings and I go to my next period, right? My next class. And we start adding up. Teachers' jaws will drop. We've had kids literally miss one to two school days per week in some of those responses. Well, it's real tough to master content when you're sitting in a buddy room or you're sitting in the discipline room. So office referrals, time out of instruction. Um, and here's an example from a middle school. So this went with the kid. So the kid, you know, filled this out, how many minutes uh, the student had to sit, write down, what did I do to get sent out? Which expectation wasn't I following? What am I gonna do different next time? You know, and I joke, as tempting as it is, don't pre-print these, <laughs> give the kids the benefit of the doubt. Here's the brilliance that this middle school did. On the back side, they reminded teachers, the kid's coming back. Even if it's the next day, you still need to process. You still need to go through what went wrong. What should the student do differently? How can I help? And then in addition, they had these little check boxes the teacher could enter data. So the bottom were their minor codes that they put in Swiss, uh, or if you're on an infant campus and you've got some kind of a dashboard, however you enter data. The other brilliant thing they did was on that right side. They put a check mark under what condition. So we created a rule. If the kid misses X hours of instruction, we bring him to the table. We've already got a treasure trove of information. We know what class period, we know what the behavior was, and we know under what conditions we're more likely to see that. All of those things are going to really help us identify and match that appropriate tier two support for that child. Always have a teacher referral option. Again, think about who can complete it. Uh, one of the questions that we sometimes get is, can, as I, as a parent, can I refer my kid? I notice they're upset, they're struggling, they're anxious about something. Can I refer my child for some tier two supports? Work these things out, create a real simple form. My rule, if it takes the teacher more than five minutes to fill it out, you're wasting their time. We can look at all those other pieces of information. I guarantee they're archived somewhere. And then the last strategy that some of our schools are using and increasingly more districts are screening. Now, on the Missouri website, we've got this screening instrument at a glance. So we've gone through as many uh, screeners that we could find out there. Some are commercial, some are free, and you kind of see the breakdown, the website, the age range, how long it takes, if there's a cost and so forth. Screening doesn't guarantee or obligate you as a district to provide service. Screening just says somebody set this kid apart a little differently than the kid sitting next to them, Let's take a look. The parallel I draw all the time, if you encounter a health professional, whether it's your annual checkup or you've been in a horrible car crash, they're gonna do two to three things right off the bat. They're gonna take your temperature, they're gonna check your pulse and your blood pressure, right? Doesn't matter if you're just in for a checkup, doesn't matter if you're bleeding profusely. They are gonna do those things because those are screeners that signal that healthcare person, hey, there's something going on as well that you really need to tune into doesn't tell you what to do, 
It doesn't say, oh, we got to take out salt. It doesn't say, you know, if the blood pressure is high. It just simply says, take a look. That's what emotional behavior screeners do as well. They just simply say, take a look. And I know it makes districts sometimes edgy and nervous. They worry that parents are going to get upset. It's a communication. Let them know. You're obligated to do it anyway by law through child fine under IDA. Let's do it more systemically. And this is also where we can catch a lot of kids. When we get to tier two and tier three, we're no longer just talking about those acting out kids. We're also talking about those more internalizing kids. Kids who are anxious, kids who are depressed, kids who are withdrawn. They're equal at risk. And they oftentimes, as I said, will fly under the radar. By screening, by having that referral option, and by prompting teachers to also look for, then we might catch more of those kids. So right now, um, let me ask you, what data or the schools or districts you're working primarily use uh, to identify kids for tier two? These polls are fun because I know you're still out there. It's not just me sitting in my office talking at my computer. <laughs> It looks like most of you are using ODRs, which is fantastic. Uh, a lot of you got a teacher referral option. Uh, a handful got some screening. Uh, and some of you are doing all the above. Fantastic. Again, there's no right or wrong. Um, the goal here is to not overburden and overwork your schools. The goal here is to catch a, a cast a wide enough net to make sure that we're catching kids sooner rather than later, right? Okay, it looks like most of you have logged in. Numbers keep changing, but again, they're lots of fun to watch. Plus, I know you're out there. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of time as well, and I want to make sure I keep moving forward and, and leave a few minutes at the end um, for questions. Uh, Julie typed in, again, depends on the school, which is, again, appropriate. Schools are going to do different things, particularly if, if one of your roles is a coaching role or a supervision role, and you work with several. When it comes to Tier 2, Tier 3 supports, here are some things to think about. First of all, they should all be centralized, meaning everybody has to go through that team to access that support. You don't want teachers doing end arounds and placing kids in supports without going through that process. And it's not to be kind of big brotherish. It's to make sure we've got enough resources to make sure we've got the range that we need. Each has a coordinator. So I'm the check and check out coordinator. I'm the small group social school coordinator. I'm the coordinator for those individual plans that require a mental health component. We place by that tier two, tier three team, we definitely continue classroom supports. Simply because a kid is placed in a tier two or tier three, we don't wanna stop those universals. In particular, we don't wanna stop working with classroom teachers. And then making sure everybody understands what their role, <coughs> excuse me, what their role is. Without that universality, we're not gonna have the impact we want. So kids who don't respond to classroom or informal, maybe a couple, three weeks, they're brought to the team. Again, we base on function, quote unquote. We're not doing a functional assessment here, but we're sort of thinking through if this kid's doing this to escape and avoid work, check in, check out is probably not going to help. This kid probably needs some academic supports. If the kid's doing it to access a lot of attention, well, check in, connect or check in, check out is a great way to appropriately access lots of adult and peer attention. In the range we talked about, self-management, check and check out, check, connect, expect, check and connect. Again, we're not endorsing one here, just looking at some of the, the strategies that got some good empirical evidence. Small group social skills, it's, it's not a new or unique set of skills or curriculum we're focusing on. It's providing more practice. So if one of our expectations is being responsible, and that means managing yourself, and the kid's not, they're blowing up, they're blaming everybody else. And we're going to give some additional practice on sort of emotional regulation. We're going to give additional practice on managing themselves, right? But it's still going to be tied and it's so critical tied to that universal. And then academics, looking at accommodations and looking at some differentiation. Many kids will meet the decision rule around behavior, but you dig and they're four or five grade levels below. And it starts making sense why they're acting out. They can't get through the content. They can't get through the reading. They get angry. They get frustrated. So they act out right? So real quick poll, what supports are you all of you currently putting in place? And again, I know it varies by school and I know a lot of you have 
supervision or direct support from many schools. Just kind of get a sense. Like all three is coming in as the leader. It's kind of like a horse race. I should I should bet on these before you guys start entering. Again, I'm hoping that you're all smiling and laughing. Wow, it looks like the majority are all three. Fantastic. So a lot of this is um, redundancy, which our good friend colleague George Sky tells us builds fluency. So that's a way to look at it, right? <laughs> we're not being redundant, we're building fluency. All right, thinking about tier three, I keep using tier two slash tier three, and I would really encourage you to do that, to think about that, that team. Instead of creating you know, multiple uh, teams that oftentimes operate independently and we don't build connect good connect pieces. Once again, use the TFI to help shape and identify some of those critical features. When we look at readiness, we've already got a standard way to identify kids at tier two. Uh, we've got a way to process or identify function of challenging behavior. Um, and at least one small group or tier two has been put in place, fully implemented, and, and, and we've seen some outcomes. Now, why do we require tier two before tier three is readiness because we want to make sure we're building in our systems as julie mentioned that coordination and monitoring across all these moving parts is difficult you start talking about kids with really intensive needs and you start talking about that individual plans we're also talking about lots of moving parts and what we're looking for is evidence that we built some fluency across our school or across our district and we've basically put some things in place to show some success, which will reduce the number of tier three supports or intensive supports that we need. Again, I showed you the data where we just looked at universal and classroom and how that those the number of kids needing intensive shrunk. That's the idea here. We wanna make sure we're building systems. We wanna make sure we're building fluency and we wanna make sure we're catching a lot of those kids who don't quite need tier three. Tier two might be sufficient to sort of pull them back in, if you will. We've also got to have documentation that we've trained uh, across all of our staff, faculty and staff. We're looking at individual data, right, to making decisions about continuing, changing, and fading. These kids eat up a whole lot of minutes. We know that. We want to make sure we're using our minutes wisely. and We are carefully monitoring. And I know this seems to be sort of burdensome sometimes to schools about looking at that individual student data, but these kids are burdensome regardless. They're eating your time. They are taking your minutes from instruction or administrators. They are eating a lot of your minutes in terms of processing. Let's use those minutes and add some of these pieces in so that we're carefully progress monitoring and tracking. And we're making either major or minor little tweaks to keep that kid on the direction and path we want. Um, and it's also a little bit more important that we're engaging families now. We absolutely want to engage our families at universal tier two through the continuum. When we start talking about this intensive, it's really going to require us to start thinking beyond, you know, the school, the school boundaries and engaging our families. So if we've engaged families within tier two, we tend to be successful. It's not quite as intense. Like, you know, your kid has really gone off the deep end. Here are the consequences that are going to happen. So we've, reached out and we're forming a little bit more positive partnerships and relationships with our families. Other tier three readiness things we look at, the administrator core group uh, who serve, once again, take a look at the TFI. It will give you all of these pieces, somebody with behavioral expertise, somebody with academic expertise. So again, they might come to the table for those behavioral challenges, but it's all about their academic struggles. We also then need to make sure we continue to send those folks to get professional development, to get training. This once again loops back to the rationale about why we've moved really at district wide. So anybody out there meet all of those tier three criteria? And if so, I would like to hire you in my center. Yeah, appreciate the honesty. Looks like most know. And it, that's I said, it's okay. It's all okay. A lot of you've got tier three, two things in place. You are doing all of those key foundational pieces to be successful when we get there. And you don't want to move too fast because you'll overwhelm the system. Um, and, and there's nothing worse 
and having things implode and then people give up and walk away. So the, tier, the TFI, as I said, it will give you specific strategies or things to think about. Don't think about people, think about function. Who could we give those skills to if they don't have them? In terms of how we operate, that core agenda, following that sort of logic of the problem solving process that we emphasize across uh, MTSS. We're getting a little bit more involvement now from the family and community. Uh, we've got some amazing documents um, out there in terms of some of this planning. We've got the integrated framework. Uh, we've got folks like Mark Weiss and Susan Barrett, and Leslie Lieber. In fact, Mark Weiss just um, led up an editorial team and we published an ebook at pbs.org about family engagement. It's there, it's yours, download it. We really encourage you to, to use that. There are some great strategies to engage family and community supports across that continuum from universals all the way to the more intensive. So as I said before, the core and the heart and soul is doing those functional assessments and creating those individual plans. That's gonna require someone with expertise in doing that. It's also gonna require kind of a clear process. At the same time, everybody in the school has got to understand this logic. Meaning, if teachers are convinced it's the kid and I don't have to do it, I don't have to change for him, it's not fair, we're not gonna be successful. It's real fun when we work with our schools and you don't hear that. You hear, okay, I'm willing to change. I need help. They understand if we're going to be successful with tough kids, we have to build an environment to increase the likelihood, not fix or solve or save that particular kid. Yes, we're going to put those supports in place. Yes, we're going to keep working on progress. But once again, it comes back to that environment. It comes back to everybody in our school understanding we got to change what we're doing if we want kids to be successful. Here are the steps, again, I'm running out of, of time and I apologize that we tend to sort of build in our standard process at tier three. Go back to the TFI, it continues to be your guide. Here's the integrated framework document um, that I talked about that you can access that aligns mental health community agencies. I know several of our school climate transformation grant recipient LEAs and SEAs also got uh, some of the SAMHSA grants, and they're doing a great job, Ohio and Wisconsin and Montana, uh, to name a few, in terms of trying to align all of these pieces and get better connections, particularly around those tier two, tier three supports, as well as promoting good mental health at tier one, right? Um, and here's an example of that. Uh, so this is, comes from Lincoln, Nebraska, where they've added some of the quote unquote trauma-informed strategies within their universal expectations. Um, another example, they've added the same thing within the check in, check out in that daily progress report. Um, and so, you know, it's not just we're going to bring in mental health at tier three, we got to bring in mental health from tier one, right from the get go. Okay, let me talk about that. So let's stop there. Any quick questions <laughs> before we wrap up? And I apologize for going, going way too long. Been tracking things along the way. Folks have been talking about the TFI. Um, one question is, is it appropriate for preschool? Um, yes, I would say, but translate those things. Um, one of the tools that um, that's underway, uh, the state of Ohio, uh, working with them, they're trying to adapt and adopt the TFI for preschool. And once they've worked through that, um, we'll absolutely post that at pbis.org and make that available to folks. Okay, as always, if there are additional questions, um, you can feel free to reach out, to email us. Uh, there's a link on their website that you can upload or uh, address questions. Our web person makes sure that they get to the right person. Just a reminder, uh, save the date. Our forum is gonna be earlier this year, September 28, 29, and it's gonna be actually in Chicago, <laughs> not the airport. It will be downtown Chicago, which will be uh, a lot of fun in that you'll be able to just walk out the hotel and have access to an amazing city. So uh, in the last minute, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to wrap up. Thank you all very much. Um, hopefully this was helpful. Look for the PowerPoints. Uh, and again, these are recorded.
so you can refer your colleagues if they weren't able to join us in real time. Thank you very much, Tim, and thanks everyone for participating today, for responding to the polls and your questions and comments in the chat pod. Um, you know, again, as I said before, um, a big thanks to Tim for being able to really elegantly describe this, this intimate connection between our Tier 2 and Tier 3 systems and the work we do in our classrooms. It's extremely important. I have posted the School Climate Transformation Grant webinar and event link in the chat pod. It's the last blue post. Do you notice I changed the color of my font to draw your attention to certain things? The previous webinars have been recorded and posted along with the materials. Uh, the U of O and uh, Kansas team are very good at getting up the materials right away, and they get those recordings up as soon as they're able to get them cleaned up and working well for all of you so that you don't click on a link and have any errors there. Please join us next time, April 27th. We have Equity in the Multi-Tiered System of Support, presented by Kent McIntosh. And please do reach out to your local technical assistance provider if you need help identifying that person. Feel free to email me. I'm going to put my email address here in the chat pod for everyone. And thank you all for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day and your week.